good to be with you again for this next presentation. And I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. And the title for this message is the sealing message of our time. We have a very special message. Now, this morning we went through during the, the first presentation, seeing the sanctuary theme through the book of Revelation. What we're going to be looking at, especially in this presentation, is what Jesus is doing and is seeking to do through his last day people. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. One thing that I forgot to mention early, and I'll say it now, for those of you who may be interested, I have books on Daniel and Revelation that I brought with me after Sabbath. I'll make them available, obviously not before. But if you're interested, I have several copies available. We're going to look at Revelation 7, and starting in verse 1, notice what Scripture says. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, Revelation chapter 7 and the first four verses is describing the sealing of the 144,000, which takes place just before Jesus comes back. And yet when I look at verse 1, it says, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Those winds, when they are released, the entire earth will feel the effect. And those winds are describing the strife that will take place on this earth around the time that Jesus comes back, just before he returns. You go to Daniel chapter 7, you see that there was the winds that strove upon the sea, and it talks about, it's describing the conflict of the kingdoms of this earth as they came into power. But at the end of the world, it's going to be a lot more than kingdoms striving for supremacy. The, The four winds, when they are released, bringing the last, strife and destruction before Jesus comes back is in reality describing the seven last plagues which take place just before Jesus comes back. But you know, you don't have to be even a a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist who's a student of Bible prophecy to understand that the world that we are living in today is a very troubled world. I mean, this world is not getting any better. It's getting worse. And the people of this world tend to look to the political leaders of this world to find solutions for the problems that are creating difficulties in society. And yet we understand when we study scripture that this world is not going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse before Jesus comes back. But there is one distinction to that point, and that is that despite the fact that the world gets worse, those who commit themselves to Jesus, their lives, our lives, will become better despite the collapse of society around us. Yes, there may be trials. Yes, there may be difficulties. But a life that is hid in Christ is a life that will get better as we wait for the coming of Jesus. Now listen. I was just listening a little bit to the news yesterday. I I was driving. I, I actually got into town Thursday night late. And I went over to Mount Rainier yesterday and I was listening to the radio 
and I was listening to commentators talk about this problem and that problem and the other problem, and it just reminded me, based on what I'm, you know, what I study and what I read and where my heart is at as I'm looking for the coming of Jesus, when I listen to human beings describe what's happening on this earth and of the uncertainties that are surrounding us. And even here in the United States, we are so polarized, we are so divided, and whatever happens, and listen, I just I'll give you a hint, whoever wins the next election is not going to save this country, in case you're wondering. Whatever happens, things just keep getting worse. And when I look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, and I see that there are four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on the trees, I'm starting to think, you know, I wonder if God's allowing those angels to loosen their grip a little bit because this society and this world is getting crazy. I mean, I'm 46. So I'm not the oldest guy in the room, but I'm not the youngest either. I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, there were some things going on. Yeah, 9-11 had just happened. But society is getting worse and worse and worse. And the good news is, is that Jesus is coming again. Because... If you've lived in this earth long enough, you realize that there is nothing in this life that is worth looking forward to compared to the coming of Jesus. Now, I want us to look a little bit more carefully at Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. It says, And after these things, I saw four angels. But here's something that when you study the Bible carefully, you should ask the question, after what things? It says, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. And when you see the four angels, you see that they will release the winds, but the winds will not be released until the 144,000 are sealed. And when God's people are sealed, not long after that, Jesus comes back. And so we see this picture, okay, four angels are holding four winds, and they're, not, they're going to not let these winds be released. The winds will not bring destruction until God's people are sealed and ready for the coming of Jesus. But at the very beginning of Revelation chapter 7, it says, and after these things. So there's, there's a prelude to what's described in Revelation chapter 7. And if you understand what comes before Revelation 7, this picture of Revelation 7, where the 144,000 are sealed after the winds are released, makes a lot more sense. So what things come first? Well, it's the first six seals of Revelation chapter 6. Now, some of you may have studied the seals before, some of you may have not. It's not hard to figure out. The seals are a very straightforward, chronological picture. Now, in John's day, and in the day that he received this vision, Pretty much everything was future, although he was living in the time of the first seal and of the white horse of the first seal. So the first seal would have been contemporary to the time that John was living, or it would have been at the same time that John was alive, the first seal and the white horse would describe that era of the world's history. And then from that time on, it would be prophetic. It would be prophecy, that which would be future. But we can look back now, and here's the amazing thing. You look at Revelation chapter 6, and basically you can look back from verse 13 to verse 1 of Revelation 6 and say, that's all in the past. And so that's what becomes very, very fascinating. So let's go to Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to see this scope of history basically from the time of Christ all the way to the end of the world. And so in Revelation chapter 6, John says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now the Lamb is Jesus, right? Jesus is the Lamb, and he opens the first seal. And what you'll notice in the first four seals is that there's a beast that goes with each of the seals being opened. But here's really what I want you to focus in on. 
The first seal, you have a white horse. The second seal, you have a red horse. The third seal, you have a black horse. And a fourth horse, you have a pale or a jaundiced or a sick-looking horse. And these are the first four seals, but they're, they continue on. The first seal with the white horse. White represents righteousness or purity. This represents the pure Christian church that arose after Jesus went back to heaven. The disciples took the gospel commission because Jesus says, take the gospel to every nation. And that's what the disciples did. And they went forth. And so you have a rider on the horse who has a bow and he's going forth conquering and to conquer. And the early Christian church went forth and according to the Apostle Paul, they took the gospel to the then known world in their generation. They conquered by the grace of God. The whole world had the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ during that first century. And so historians commonly place the first seal and the white horse from about 31 AD at the death of Christ and his ascension to heaven until about 100 AD, where at that point, all of the early apostles died off. Then we have the second seal, which describes a red horse. And we see that the peace was taken from the earth. And there was a lot of persecution. Red is a symbol of blood. And this was a persecuted church where many, many Christians died for their faith. And this culminated towards the end of this period of time in 10 years of persecution from 313 to 323. But historians place the second seal from 313 to, or excuse me, from 100 to 313 AD. So the first seal goes to about 100. The second seal goes to from 100 to 313. And God's people are being persecuted. And then you have the third seal, which is a black horse. And this black horse is a compromised church. So you go from a white church, a pure church in the first seals to the time that you get to the third seal, you have a black horse, which is a compromised church. Now notice this. There's this balance in the hand of the one who is on the black horse. And he says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Now a measure of wheat is not that much. It's about a cup of wheat. And it would cost about a penny. Now if if we could buy that for a penny today, that would sound great. But in the Bible, do you know how much a penny was worth? When Jesus gave a parable, a penny was used to describe how much? One day's wage. So if you spend, and here in America you would work on average eight hours. It might, some might work a little more, some might work a little less. Some people work 12 hours at certain um, jobs. You want to spend an entire day working to have just enough wheat to make a small loaf of bread. Does that sound like good pay? Not at all. No matter what part of the world you live in, if you're getting paid enough money in one day to make just a little bit of bread, which is barely enough to feed yourself, that is not good pay. And what this means is that during the third seal, the Christian church was compromising so much. Now, wheat is used to make bread, and bread <clears throat> is a symbol of Christ and of his word in Scripture. What's happening in the church is that the word of God is becoming so scarce that you can barely find it. And... The scarcity of God's word or the lack of its availability is described as saying it would take near or a day's wage just to get a small amount. And then you get to the fourth seal and the church becomes sick, death and hell followed him. And historically we understand, so the first seal up until 100 is the the conquering Christian church, the second church till 313 AD is the persecuted Christian church. And then the third seal is the compromising church where the truth starts to go away. And this is from about 313 to 538. It is during this 
era in the history of the world that Constantine comes along and changes Sabbath to Sunday and tradition starts to be placed above the teachings of Scripture. And then finally, in the fourth seal with a sick, pale horse, we see that the church is completely sick. And so we see that this describes the rise of the papacy in 538. And the papacy ruled for 1260 years, but the fourth seal doesn't last that long. Why do I say that? Because in the fifth seal, we see a protest where souls cry out under the altar, how long, O Lord, till you judge and avenge our blood. So I believe that the fifth seal describes the rise of the Protestant Reformation, which began first in 1374 with John Wycliffe, and then it really reached a climax with Martin Luther in the 1500s. And so we can follow down through history. Excuse me. This is interesting to follow, and this isn't really even the main point of my sermon, but it's giving you a path to follow from history. So you have the early Christian church, which is pure. Then you have the persecuted church. Then the compromising church. Then the sick church, the papacy, who goes out and destroys anyone who is in favor of it. And then we have this protest against the abuses of the sick Christian church. And the Protestant Reformation comes along. And I would add that we as God's people today continue this protest protest against any system or any belief that does not follow what the Bible teaches. Listen, friends, we are not, as God's people in this time of earth's history, to be going along with what culture teaches. If culture, if what they're saying goes along with the Bible, well, that's fine. But if culture is going against what the Bible teaches, we protest against that. We live by the word of God. And so the fifth seal begins with the protest with Wycliffe in England in 1374, and then it spreads throughout Europe and Martin Luther in Germany. And this is where things become interesting. Because in the sixth seal, we can start to line things up in a very clear fashion as to where we are, prophetically speaking, in the history of this world. And if you've never seen this before, this should make you wide awake to the reality of where we are as far as in the history of the world. Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 12. So we've seen the first five seals, and we've seen the history of the Christian church, and then the rise of the Protestant Reformation, and those who were persecuted, all of that. And then in verse 12, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as sackcloth, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, if you study the teachings of Jesus, this should cause you to realize that these are signs that Jesus gives that describe his coming and of the end of the world. Now, when you come to Matthew chapter 24, Starting in verse 29, Jesus gives signs that describe his coming and of the end of the world. If you go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So when you study the the teachings of Jesus, and that's found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and in Luke 21, you know that the sun becoming darkened, where the sun goes dark, and when the stars fall from heaven and the moon looks like it's blood, those are signs of the coming of Jesus. Jesus says so. And when we follow Jesus, and when we follow his teachings, and we study, his, Jesus taught so many different things, but Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, they're describing the same message that Jesus gives. This is the message that Jesus says, if you want to know what the signs will be that will let you know that my coming is near, when you see the sun become darkened, and the moon doesn't give her light and becomes like blood, and the stars fall from heaven, you will know that you have entered into the era of this world's history where my coming is near. Does that make sense? 
So when I'm st- when I see that in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, I don't know the exact time, but I'm like, okay, I know that that's something to look out for. When the sun becomes darkened and the moon turns to blood and the stars fall from heaven and there's this great earthquake, then I will know that Jesus is coming again and that he's coming again soon. Well, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, we have a clear timeline because the first seal is through 180, the second seal takes us to 313, the third seal takes us to 538, the fourth seal takes us to 1374, and the fifth seal describes the rise of the Protestant Reformation in 1374 until we get to the sixth seal, and then there's this great earthquake. You know what this great earthquake was? It's the Lisbon earthquake of November 1, 1755 in Lisbon, Portugal, over in Europe. This earthquake was so massive that it was felt throughout Europe. It created a tidal wave. It was felt all the way into Africa. Some reports say it was felt in places far, far away. And it created a tidal wave. It wiped out the city of Lisbon. And this was on November 1, 1755. The sign that the sixth seal had been opened in heaven. And we continue down, after the great Lisbon earthquake, the sun becomes black of south cloth. This is the dark day of May 19, 1780 in North America, where for no reason that has ever been explained by meteorologists or astronomists or whoever, May 19, 1780, merely 25 years after the Lisbon earthquake, at 10 o'clock in the morning in New England, for no reason at all, the sun goes dark. 10 o'clock in the morning. The sun had been only up for a few hours. People were just getting started with their work. They'd been maybe working for a couple of hours or three hours, and they have to come home because everything goes dark, and they look up in the sky, and the moon looks like blood. And those who studied the Bible said, this is a sign of the coming of Jesus. This is in 1780, 25 years after the Lisbon earthquake. And then it says the stars would fall from heaven 53 years later on November 13, 1833, again in New England. There was a meteor shower that was so intense, nobody had ever seen anything like it. So you have 1755, 1780, 1833, and those who were students of Scripture recognized in these events the signs that Jesus had foretold of his coming and of the end of the world, and they said, this is the beginning of the sixth seal. Now, this is what made everybody get really excited. You know what happens after the falling of the stars in 1833, which is described in verse 13? Verse 14 says, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand verses 14 through 17 of revelation 6 what are they describing I mean, this is not a hard question. What's being described in Revelation 6, verses 14 through 17? That's the second coming of Jesus. Where the wicked are calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, and they're saying, hide us from the face of the wrath of the lamb. I mean, when's the last time you've seen a lamb so angry that you wanted to hide from it? I mean, that's the point. Nobody should logically want to hide from a lamb, especially the lamb. But this describes the second coming of Jesus. The lamb who died to save man, those who he died to save are afraid of him because they've rejected him. Now, if you're studying scripture and if you're thinking about what I'm saying, you're like, well, this is rather interesting. We have a clear line of chronology. 
the first seal takes us to 180. The second seal takes us to 313. The third seal takes us to 538. The fourth seal takes us to 1374. And the Protestant Reformation begins with the fifth seal. And then we get to the sixth seal and we have these clearly delineated events which Jesus said are the signs of his coming and of the end of the world. Lisbon earthquake of 1755. Dark day of 1780. Falling of the stars 1833. And then, in the, in the seals, the next thing to happen after 1833 is the second coming of Jesus. Well, last time I looked at the calendar, we just came into a new year, 2024. November 13, 2023, marked 180 years, no, 100, excuse me, 190 years. Since the falling of the stars in 1833. And you may be asking the question <clears throat> Is any of this even true? Is Jesus really going to come back? Or are you just making stuff up from history to create an interesting historical timeline? And here's my response to this. This historical timeline is as true as I am standing here and you're sitting in the pew today. This historical timeline is true. And these historical events that begin the sixth seal are, are as true as anything. They really did happen and they are the signs of the coming of Jesus. So the question is, why has Jesus not yet come back? And the answer is found in Revelation chapter 7 where we begin, where in Revelation chapter 7 starting in verse 1 it says, and after these things. So here's the things that we just spent the last several minutes talking about. The first six seals, the pure church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the sick church, the reformation, and then the signs of the coming of Jesus, Lisbon earthquake, dark day, falling of the stars. After these things, and then there's even a picture of what it will look like when Jesus comes back. After these things, notice what John says, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God and their foreheads. Now, and just so you know who the servants of God who are sealed are, verse 4 shows it's the 144,000. The 144,000 are also described in Revelation 14 as standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb, having the Father's name in their forehead. So the seal of God and the Father's name are synonymous, and they are said to have no guile in their mouth, no deceit in their mouth. These are people who have become just like Jesus. They've received the seal of God in their forehead. And Isaiah 57 verse 15 says that the Father's name is holy. They have become a holy people through the power of God and God has placed his seal upon them and here's the point the reason why Jesus has not yet come even though the sixth seal began all the way back in 1755 and then you have the earthquake of 1755 the dark day of 1780 the falling of the stars in 1833 and then it looks like Jesus is going to come shortly after that and if you study Bible prophecy, we understand based on the 2300 days, 11 years after the falling of the stars, Jesus went into the most holy place on October 22, 1844 to begin the final judgment in heaven. And ever since then, we've been waiting for him to come back. And scripture says he will not come back until the 144,000 are sealed. Now, think about this. God is going to have a people who go through the final crisis of earth's history. Now, I've noticed a trend in Christian churches and sometimes in even the Adventist church where we say, you know, I'm not worried about what's coming. I just need to know who's coming. Have you, have you ever heard anybody say that before? I don't need to worry about what's coming. I just need to know who's coming. 
Well, my question to that then is, is, why did Jesus tell us what's coming? If I don't need to know what's coming, I just need to know who's coming. Why did then Jesus tell me what's going to come? Because the reason why Jesus tells us what is coming is because he tells us in Matthew 24 that false Christ and false prophets will arise and deceive many. So if you don't know what's coming, you'll see someone come along who will sound just like a Jesus that you could paint in your own mind and you'll fall for it because you're not following what Jesus said with respect to the signs of his coming. And what we tend to do then is we tend to water things down and say, you know what, that prophecy stuff is so complicated. Let's just focus on knowing Jesus and we won't have to worry about what comes because we're ready for him to come. And yet that's not what Jesus says in scripture. He says false Christ will arise and deceive many. I don't want to be deceived. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Here's the problem that many people are facing today. If I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, there's a lot of people today who are baby Christians. And it's okay to be a baby Christian if you've just met Jesus. And there may be someone like that here today. If you've just met Jesus, it's best to be a baby Christian right now. You can't go from being a baby to a full-grown adult in three days. That just doesn't happen. But the problem for the Christian church is that the Christian church has become satisfied with baby food. We want baby food for a baby Christian experience and we don't want to know about last day events and of the things that are going to happen at the end of the world. And yet, I'm telling you this. Jesus is waiting until he will have a people who are sealed in their foreheads so they can go through that final crisis of earth's history where the four winds are released. And the reality is this. Jesus isn't going to take baby Christians through the final crisis. Jesus is going to take people who are weaned from the milk of the word, who start to partake of the meat of the word. Now, you might be at a place in your life where you've just come into the faith, you've just met Jesus, and right now you're studying from the milk of the word, and that's fine. In the, the book of First and Second Peter, it talks about how when you drink from the milk of the word, you're strengthened from it. And the purpose for drinking the milk of the word is so that you'll grow as a baby so that you can start eating stronger food. That's the purpose of baby milk. I mean, I happen to have five kids. Fifth one was a surprise, by the way. First four were planned. And I can say with all five of them, they all needed baby milk to start. My oldest kid is now 13. She doesn't eat baby milk. Now, I'm not here, and I, I happen to be a neurologist, and I do have special needs patients. I'm not here to make fun of special needs people. They are special in God's sight very special, and God loves them as much as anybody else. But I'm talking about just norm, the normal order of things. My 13-year-old is not special needs, so she eats regular food now. But some of us think that if we can just stay on baby milk, we'll be judged for just drinking baby milk, and God won't hold us accountable for the meat of the word that is there for us to learn and to study. And yet, that's not how it works. God is saying, I am looking for a people at the end of time who will get off of the baby food, which is there to help you grow in your early walk with the Lord, and you're going to grow from being a baby Christian to being the full measure that God will would have you to be, and that's why all of the word is there. So when I look at scripture, I not only know who is coming, the who that is coming tells me what is coming that precedes when he comes, and I want to know that. Listen, my 13-year-old, she's doing really well in school. I mean, you know, she has her set of gifts, and I'm glad for where she is in her development, but you know what? As her father, I wouldn't let her take final exams for medical school next week. You know why? She's not ready. 
And if she took, you know, she could sit down and take a multiple choice test on a computer and do the, the anatomy exam and do a pathophysiology exam and a microbiology exam. And boy, I'd hate to think how I might even do on those tests today. It's been a while. If she got any questions right, it would just be by pure guessing. Because she's not ready for that. But here's the thing. If she keeps studying, maybe someday, if time should last, she would be ready for those examinations. And that's what God is doing with us. He's testing us, and he's trying to wean us from the milk of the word so that we'll start to partake of the stronger food of Scripture so that our faith will be strengthened, so that we'll grow into the full measure of the person that God wants us to be, so that when the time is right, he can place his seal of holiness upon us. You know, there's a lot of people who, as they study Scripture and they stay on the milk of the word, they hear other baby Christians talking who don't want to advance. And many baby Christians go around saying, you know what, the Bible just says that as long as we love Jesus, it doesn't matter what we do in life. So let's just love the Lord and do whatever we want and it doesn't matter. That's not what the Bible teaches. God is going to have a people at the end of the world who have given their lives to him completely so he can place his seal upon them. Now, let's think about a few things here. The 144,000 are the people of God who will go through the final crisis of earth's history. They will receive the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, we as Seventh-day Adventists have understood down through time as we study scripture that a seal has been used to describe the name, the title, and the jurisdiction of someone who is like a judge or a president or a leader. So it gives their name, their title, and what territory that they have authority over. And so we've said, you know, it makes sense that God, who is the ultimate authority of the the universe, would have a seal that denotes his authority. And we say the Sabbath is that seal. And of course, I believe that. But And then, you know, we use these verses from Scripture that show that that the Sabbath is the sign that God sanctifies his people in Romans 4, shows how a sign and a seal are used interchangeably. And so, you know, all of that's true, and I believe that, and I do believe that the Sabbath is God's seal for the last days. But there's, there's a reason why on a deeper level. You know, coming to church on the right day is a good start. I'm glad you're in church this Sabbath. But there's something more than just coming to church on the right day. The Sabbath is a sign that God sanctifies his people. That's what Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 12 and 20 say. And Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 283, in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. The Sabbath, as I've learned in my own walk with God, it's, it's a sign that God is sanctifying me, that he's sanctified me, that he's setting me apart. And every Sabbath is a sign, as I come into my Sabbath sundown experience on Friday night until sundown on Sabbath, it's a sign or a reflection of what my walk is like with God throughout the week. Now, I'm not here to make anybody feel bad, but this is just something to think about. You know, there's, there's two kinds of Adventists, maybe more, but in this, for this illustration, it works. There's Adventists who look forward to sundown on Friday night, And then there's Adventists who look forward to sundown on Saturday night. (laughs) You know, we shouldn't be looking forward to sundown on Saturday night. Because Sabbath is a day that shows that Jesus is the Lord of our lives and we love him and we've given our lives to him. But if the rest of our life has become more important to us than Jesus, then when Sabbath comes, it's like, oh man, like I can't see if the Mariners or the Seahawks are going to get in this to the playoffs or you know whatever your team is, I don't care. But I mean, and then we're like, you know, or oh man, I can't make extra money today. Like I, if, I, if I were able to even work two Sabbaths a month, you know how much extra money I would be making for my retirement? Or you, I mean, you, you can think of any, any illustration that you want. Sabbath is a reflection of our walk with God. 
Now, I just have a few minutes left here. There's one other statement I want to read, and I want you to think about this. This is from Maranatha, page 200. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Now notice the seal of God, yes, the Sabbath is is at the heart of that, but it's a settling into the truth intellectually, meaning our knowledge of truth is settled. We know what truth is, But it's not just a settling into the truth in our mind so that we know what truth is. It's a settling into the truth in our hearts so that the truth as it is in Jesus, because Jesus is the truth, makes us like Jesus spiritually. Now, I don't think I have to say this, but you know how many times I've seen people in the church who can explain the truth They can give you a Bible study on the state of the dead and a Bible study on the health message and a Bible study on the Sabbath and a Bible study on prophecy and they're like one of the meanest people you've ever met. Just come to the church board meeting and oh no, you better not be against them because if you are, they are going to erupt like a volcano. Now, look, I haven't been briefed on anything about what your board meetings are like, but I've been part of enough churches to say with authority that usually in almost every church there's at least one person like that at the board meeting. And so, like, we've settled into the truth. We know that the seventh day is the Sabbath. We know that when we die, we sleep in the grave until Jesus comes. We know that Jesus went into the most holy place on October 22, 1844. We even know that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. But we're none of that. But we think that somehow God's going to overlook that because we know it in our mind. Now listen, receiving the seal of God, part of it is settling into the truth intellectually so that we're not confused. And I mean, I get so frustrated. It's like you hear people come along saying, hey, I have a new truth I want to share with you. Jesus isn't God. No, come on. And so you have like these anti-Trinitarians that come along or you can have other groups who come along and say, we have a new prophecy for you to understand. The 2520, no, no, no. You know, those are signs that someone has not settled into the truth intellectually. And there are certain people in the church who just have a penchant for going for the latest, greatest heresy whenever it comes along. And that means they're not ready to receive the seal of the living God. But receiving the seal of God is more than knowing what is true. And that's important. We need to know what truth is and we need to defend what truth is. But receiving the seal of God is not only settling into the truth intellectually, it's settling into the truth spiritually. You know how God helps us to settle into the truth spiritually? I'll just tell you what it's been like for me. You know, in The Laodicean message, Jesus stands at the door knocking and he says to Laodicea, I counsel you, I advise you, I recommend to you that you buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment and I have. Now, in order for Jesus to come in to Laodicea, we must buy what he is selling. He is the heavenly merchant man who is selling gold tried in the fire, white raiment, and I have. Now, the gold, according to 1 Peter 1 verse 7, is the trial of our faith. So when we buy the gold, we get faith that comes through the refining process of trials. And then, of course, the white raiment is his perfect righteousness, and the I have is discernment. So what we as God's people need is righteousness by faith, the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith. And that's Laodicea's problem. We think that the baby food that we're eating will get us by even though we don't have the righteousness of Christ. So how do we settle into the truth intellectually and spiritually, especially spiritually? I believe it's to buy the gold and the white raiment and the eye salve. And, you know, the trials, the gold that we buy which is the fiery trials, that's what's 
removing the impurities from our life. Just as gold going through the fire has the impurities removed, when we buy that gold, we are saying, Lord, do whatever it takes, and I'm claiming this by faith, do whatever it takes to remove the impurities and to save me and to give me the faith that I need to withstand the final crisis of the earth's history. I can tell you that the fiery trials that God allows, he doesn't cause, but he allows are real. Now listen, a trial is not a trial if it's easy. You know, like, I remember five, six years ago, my family got stuck in Dallas for 30 hours on a vacation. We were going out west, and weather was a big mess in Dallas-Fort Worth, and we got stuck in the airport for 30 hours, and it felt like, you know, we were going through Jacob's time of trouble at the time, and now I look back, and I'm like, give me a break. I mean, if that's the hardest thing you ever go through... You got it pretty good. If a 30-hour airport delay is the hardest thing you've been through in life, that's, that's just like the minor league trials. I'm not saying it's not a trial at all, but that's a minor league trial. You know what's a real trial? And I'm sure we could have a testimony session of trials if we had time. Your spouse walks out on you unexpectedly. A child dies. You have a terminal illness. You lose your job unexpectedly. You're treated unfairly by church members or family members, whatever it may be. Those are trials that test your faith to show what kind of character do you really have to go through the final crisis of earth's history. And just in a couple of minutes here, I'm going to tell you, in my own personal experience, you may have noticed that my right hand doesn't really look kind of like my left hand. Well, I had a bad accident two years ago. It was the Sunday after Thanksgiving of 21. And to make a long story short, I accidentally slipped down the stairs into my basement. And I went 15 steps all the way down into the basement, landed right here, had a compound fracture of the humerus, and I'm laying on the ground, and I happen to be a neurologist, and I happen to do a fellowship in peripheral nerve neurology. And I'm like, you know... I know that I fractured the humerus, and it doesn't feel good, but I'm not so worried about that because I know that orthopedic specialists are outstanding, and they're going to put that bone back together, and they did. But I knew that the radial nerve is right there. And I'm like, can I extend my wrist? Because the radial nerve innervates your extensor muscles distal to the elbow. And, you know, I wished I didn't know all of that, and I wish this had never happened. I mean, I'd be better off if I didn't know any of this, but that's the way it is. So I'm laying on the ground, and I'm like, okay, let me extend my wrist now. And I couldn't. And here I am two years later, and I still have wrist drop from radial neuropathy. I've even had a nerve graft surgery from a leading peripheral nerve surgeon in Atlanta. And I was actually going to come and speak at this church a couple of years ago, and I, w- I had to cancel that because of the surgery that I had. It's been a trial. I mean, I was 44 at the time that that happened. This is my dominant hand. And I'm facing the rest of my life having wrist drop. And then, you know... Um, bless people's hearts in the church and elsewhere, sometimes when we say things to people who are going through a hard time, what we say actually doesn't help. It just makes it worse. Like, everything happens for a reason. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, Could have been worse. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I could have died on the drive to church today. It could always be worse. But you don't think it was bad that I lost the use of my dominant hand? I mean, now look, there's probably some of you here right now who are thinking, I wish that was my trial, and I'll give you that. Because I know that this isn't going to kill me. I have friends who have terminal illnesses right now that don't have any reasonable hope of getting out of that. And that's, that's a worse trial than this. But I am saying this, this is a real trial. And whatever your trial is, whether it's what I'm going through or whatever you're going through, you have a decision to make about how you're going to handle the trial. Are you going to, by faith, say, God, this is that gold tried in the fire that you've asked me to buy so that I will settle into the truth intellectually so that I know all the truths for this time, but also spiritually so that I go th- as I go through this crisis, I have the love of Jesus and I have his character. Because listen, friends, when the four winds are released, and God's people are sealed and they go through the final crisis of earth's history, God is not going to be taking baby Christians who have never been tested through that final crisis. God is going to be taking people 
who have been tested. Their faith has been tried. You've gone through something very, very difficult. And you have learned by faith to hang on to Jesus through that trial. So that like Jacob, you can say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Friends, that's what God is calling us to be right now. So, as we wrap this up, I just want to challenge you. Let's be like Jesus. You know, Ellen White says in Christ Object Lesson 69, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. That character she defines as the fruit of the Spirit. Having love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That fruit is developed through the trials of life. Either the trials make us like Jesus or they break us. But God is looking for a people who will represent his character to the world. And that quote goes on to say, and this is where I'm going to wrap up, it is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, where all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. That's what the world needs. The world needs people who are like Jesus. So we don't have to be here for another hundred years. As we see the world rapidly disintegrating, it tells me that Jesus is coming soon and I want to be part of that people. Amen.